So let's get started. Uh, a few announcements. First, we're going to have a quiz today in the second half of this class. Second, we will not have a class on Wednesday since I'll be out of town. Uh, however, I'll announce the makeup. Alright, so today what we're going to discuss is momentum. We've already seen position and we defined an operator called a position operator that acts on the position state. The result is the measurable x and the position state itself. Alright, so pay attention please. No matter what you do, there's nothing extra you can learn about the quiz in this one hour. So please pay attention to this. Now, position is a measurable because it is something experimentally observable. Likewise, momentum is an observable. Okay. So, generally we denote momentum by the letter P. So, since this is an observable, we can identify an operator with it, P hat. And this acts on a momentum item state, P. The result is the measurement outcome, the eigenvalue of the operator, which is the momentum and one obtains the same state back again. So if get P is an eigenstate of the momentum operator, the measurement outcome is the momentum in kilogram meters per second. This is in meters or centimeters or millimeters. So these are real numbers corresponding to results of experimental measurements. And this is just a quantum state P. Now, in this quantum state P, any quantum quantum states in itself generally can be denoted them by psi. So this psi can be written in any basis. We can write this quantum state in the position basis or in the momentum basis. Now all the x's they form all the ken x's form a basis of the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, that's why we were able to write the identity operator as a sum or integral over all the possible values of get x bra x, right? Where x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Mm -hmm. Any quantum state could be decomposed as a summation of all the get x's, which means the get x's form a complete basis. That's why the identity operator could be decomposed in this form, where x can take up all possible values. This is the definition of a basis, right? All the x's get x's form a basis for the Hilbert space. Likewise, all the cat p's form a basis for the Hilbert space, right? Therefore, I could also write the identity operator as sum over all values of p, cat p, bra p, where p goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. There's nothing special about position. You could have a particle that is moving in one dimension in the Euclidean space. It can have any position whatsoever. Which means it could be in any get x state whatsoever. Likewise, the same particle could, could have any momentum uh, mm -hmm. possible. So it could have any, it could exist in any state can be. Now, if there are no restrictions on the values of the momentum, all the ket p's will form a basis. Any quantum state can be written as a sum over, as a linear combination of ket p's. Right? That's why the ket p's also form a basis. And that, for the same reason, we can decompose the identity operator in this fashion. For a quantum state, psi, we can write this state as a summation or integral over x's. We've learned that we can al always write this state as a s an integral over all possible values of x, get x, dx, and the overlap of the of the state with x, right? When x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? We've already proved that. Which means that any quantum state, and the quantum state is independent of the basis. 
no matter whether you measure the state or not, the quantum state does exist. It's a reality. It's an objective reality. It is not waiting for you to be looked at. The quantum state is an objective reality that exists whether you look at it or not. And you can decompose this state into any basis you like. One possibility is decomposing this as an integral of get axis. So you write, it's an integral, it's, it takes up all possible values of get axis, where x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. This shows that you have to increment axis, and this is the overlap of or the inner product of the quantum state with the particular value of get x. This is called the wave function, right? So, the quantum state that is independent of any basis. If you would like to write it in a basis, we can write this as dx, the wave function, which is a function of x, get x. Where x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay? So, this wave function we've noticed is an equivalent representation of this quantum state. This quantum state lives in a Hilbert space. This wave function lives in a, in a space of functions. But this function is totally analogous to this quantum state. It's a description of the quantum state in the position basis. Right? So you can either choose to work with kets, which live in the Hilbert space, or you can choose to work with these functions, which are called wave functions. It depends upon what you've been asked for, what is easier to do. So both of them represent equivalent ways of talking about the quantum state. Now if all the get x's form a basis, all the get p's also form a basis, there's nothing special about the position. You can express the quantum state as a superposition of momentum eigenstates. Because the momentum states also represent a basis, they form a basis. Okay? So you can also represent flow state in an alternative fashion. You can write get psi equals dp get p the quantum state overlap with the momentum ideal state where p goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. There's no harm in writing this expression. It's exactly analogous to this expression. There's no nothing special with get axis. If your apparatus is measuring x, for example, you have an electron microscope that is measuring the position of an electron, you would like to represent your state in this fashion. However, if you have an instrument that is measuring the momentum of the particle, for example, you're doing an interference pattern and you're looking at the interference fringes that are being formed, the separation of those interference fringes depends upon the momentum of the particle. It depends upon k. K is proportional to the momentum. K is the wave number. Therefore, if you're doing an interference experiment, you would like to represent your state in the momentum basis. And this is how you would represent the state in the momentum basis. Okay? So this is an alternative expression of the same quantum state. This quantum state and this quantum state may represent the same facet of reality. Both of them are identical, identical quantum states. Because the quantum state should not depend upon what basis you choose to measure it. The state is a state. And the state has all the complete information that there is to be learned about the system. However, for experiments or for measurements, you choose a basis. Would you like to measure the position or would you like to measure the momentum or would you like to measure the energy or you would like to measure the angular momentum? Right? So you have to represent your state in a basis. Here we are representing it in the position basis, here we are representing it in the momentum basis. Now this object is just the representation of the state in the momentum basis. And it should be a function, it's a number, right? And what should this number depend upon? What is the parameter? P, the momentum. So this is a function of momentum. And I can represent this by psi, which is a function of p. And just to show that it is a, a function of p, I put a, I put a tilde on top of it or a twiddle on top of it. So this is 
the wave function in the position basis. This is the wave function in the momentum basis. This can be a sine function. This need not be a sine function. It can be a cosine function or a Dirac delta function. So the, this function is different from this function. Right? It can be the same. It can be different. That's why to represent the distinctness of this function, I put a tilde on top of it. Okay, I is the example. You get a clearer picture. All right? Any questions about this? Notational or this definition that you talk about. Yeah. So we studied a thing uh, called degrees of freedom. So the state here, the cat, the uh, psi cat, is actually contains information about all the degrees of freedom of a particular reality. Right. And these bases are actually those different degrees of freedom. Right. Which we represent the state. This particle is moving. It has a position and a momentum at the same time. Now what are you measuring? Are you measuring using a camera? You can measure both the position and the momentum. You can track velocities by looking at frames one after the other. So the same particle, it's an objective reality, it has a quantum state. Now what are you measuring? Are you measuring its position or its momentum or its spin or the parts that it takes? All of these are degrees of freedom. But everything is contained inside the quantum state. Here we choose to represent it in the position basis, here we choose to represent it in the momentum basis. Okay. A quantum state will have a wave function in the position basis, the same object will have a wave function in the momentum basis. Okay? Now when you start a mechanics course, physics 101, you start with position or position vector as a function of time, then you uh, differentiate it, you get the velocity, you multiply velocity with mass, you get the momentum. That's the starting point in a classical, classical mechanics course. But here, we defer this discussion to the latter half of the quantum mechanics course because the finite dimensional systems are easier to deal with. They are more natural to quantum mechanics. Here we're dealing with an infinite dimensional system, which is non-quantized because the position can take up any value possible. All analog values possible between minus infinity to plus infinity. If you measure the position, it's not quantized. Right? It's variable. It's continuously variable. Likewise, the momentum is not quantized for a free particle, right? So these are continuous variables. They're continuously varying uh, parameters. <laughs> Alright, so with this uh, definition, I would like to introduce an operator called the translational operator. So he has a very first lecture in the first lecture in the first lecture. So he has a good one. Alright, so let's define an operator. For a translational operator that takes up a parameter dx, it acts on the state kth x. Right? And what it does is it produces a new state called G labeled x plus dx. Okay. Is this a state, an eigen state of the operator? No, it's not because you get a new state. Likewise, the translational operator with the parameter d acting on the same state cat x gives me x plus d. So this is called a translational operator and we learn why is it called a translational operator. <coughs> now suppose I have uh, a translational operator E acting on a general quantum state of psi. General quantum state of psi. This general quantum state might be given in a position basis like this. Now what I have is there's no harm in putting an identity before E acting on the wave function uh, on the quantum state. What I would like to see is how does this translational operator change the wave function? 
this is the question. I know that it changes the quantum state in the Hilbert space. Okay? But I cannot draw quantum states. I cannot plot quantum states. Quantum states live in a Hilbert space. I cannot plot Hilbert spaces. Only for a spin half system, I use the mnemonic or the tool of a block scale. That's a simplification. For a state ket, ket x, I do not know what, how to draw the Hilbert space. Okay? So I cannot draw these quantum states. However, I can plot wave functions. Because they are functions of x. I can plot functions. And you've been plotting these wave functions in your modern physics course as well. So what I would like to see is that if I have some wave, some quantum state psi, which has a wave function psi s, psi x, now I get a new state, right? This is a new state. Let's call it phi x, phi, ket phi. Right? I get a new state. I know that this state is going to be different from the original state. I want to find a wave function of this new quantum state, right? Which means I would like to find out phi as a function of x. I would like to see how the translation operator changes the wave function. Because the wave functions are something easier to plot. Okay? So now I start with this uh, recipe, the translational operator acting on the wave function on the quantum state. Even a bar with wave functions together, armed or the donor synonymous is the model. But this is a I would like to make a distinction. This is a quantum state. So the quantum state acts on the the operator acts on the state, I put an identity operator in front of it, there is no harm in doing that. I expand this identity operator in this form. I write it as the sum of the outer products of x, dx, ket x, bra x, x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Translational operator acting on the wave function. Okay, now let's see. X goes from minus infinity to plus infinity dx. I bring everything into the integral. Okay, dx. Now, if I open this parenthesis, if I open this parenthesis, this bra x, this e, this can becomes an inner product. Where this operator is sandwiched between this x and this function. So it becomes a number. So I can write this as bra x e wave function psi and this get x goes here. Right? I can always do this. Fine. This is a fixed quantum state, some quantum state psi. So I can bring it into the integral. Now this is some number. Right? It's an inner product, so it has to be scalar. Perhaps a complex number, but some number. Now I know that E acts on get x to give me x plus b. Okay? If I write the dual of this expression, x e dagger b t dagger b gives me draw x plus b. Is this true? <coughs> now, I would like to find out what is key dagger D. Is it that key dagger D is key dagger D is T of minus T. Right. 
how, how do I know that? I know that P is inverse of D. What is T inverse of D? It's an operator. It's the inverse of this operator. What is the inverse of this operator? D of minus D. Okay. If I have some state, say A, I put P inverse of B, P, B, A, what should I get? I should get, get bra A, get A which is 1, if A is normalized. Now suppose this is cat 5. Right? Suppose that P D acting on A gives me cat 5. Now this object should also be bra 5 because if I take the inner product of 5 in itself I get 1. Okay? Correct? Hence bra phi equals bra a being acted upon by t inverse of b but t of b acting on a is phi this is how we define phi if i take the dual of this i get bra a t dagger of b gives me bra phi but bra phi is also equal to this a p inverse of b right which means that p dagger of d equals p inverse of b which but p inverse of b you already told me equals p of minus d Hence, T e dagger D equals the T inverse of D, which means T is unity. I give you one minute to go through this derivation. I replace this with a minus b. 
I will get P D. Right? So I just put a minus here, I put a minus here, I get plus D. Okay? Hence, if I were to look at this expression, I can replace this P D with a P dagger of minus D. So looking at this expression, Sir, what is x plus d? Here. 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 The Hermitian adjoint equals its inverse. It's not a Hermitian operator. It's a unitary operator. It's not a Hermitian operator. Remember, its dagger equals its inverse. It's a unitary operator, not a Hermitian operator. अगर ये ऐसे होता ना, inverse ना होता, तब भी Hermitian operator बनता. So it does not correspond to an observable. It's not a Hermitian operator. It doesn't correspond to an observable. Now, if you look at this expression, P D acting on a general quantum state psi, I obtain. I use this expression. My bar bar ki limits me itra minus infinity plus infinity dx. Now this term I can write as bra x T dagger. Of minus d, get psi, get x, right? I just use this expression. T of d equals t dagger of minus d. Now, could you please tell me if this operator acts on x from the right? What is this bra equal to? X. Minus d, right? Because it's it's acting in the dual space. Therefore, there is a dagger here, and the parameter is minus d. So it's going to change x to x minus d. The dagger is necessary here because it's acting in the dual space. If we did not have a dagger here, then it would be equal to t dagger of plus d. So you get an x plus d here. Okay. So this equals dx x minus d psi get x. This is the action of p e on p. Okay. Now I would like to. Now this is a new function I am creating. I would like to find out what this function is in the position space. I would like to find out the wave function corresponding to this new cat. Now there are two ways of doing this. One is direct. If I compare this expression with this is some state, let's call this state phi. Some state phi, right? It's a cat. This is a cat. An operator acting on a cat is a cat. If I compare this expression with this expression, can you identify what the wave function is going to be? It's going to be psi of x minus d. Right? This wave function is is this. If I replace this x by a y, I get psi of the function of y. If I replace this by x dash, I get x dash here. If I replace this with by x minus d, I get x minus d. So one way of looking at it is, is that the wave function phi. Which is the wave function corresponding to the new quantum state that I have prepared? Is simply this x minus d psi, which is psi x minus d. Okay. The other approach is to find the wave function corresponding to this quantum state. The other approach is. To find the overlap of the quantum state with x, if you have any state psi, you want to find the wave function. You just find the inner product with x. This will give you the wave function. 
This is the wave function as a function of x. This is representing the quantum state in the position basis. So I just take this state and find its overlap with x. So I find x get phi. This will give me the wave function as a function of x. Now I take the overlap with x, right? I put bra x here. Now since I've introduced x, I would like to change the variable to bx dash inside the integral. bx dash x dash minus b psi x dash. And the limit is for x dash going to minus infinity to plus infinity. Now I just take this bra inside. Right? Now this is a number. Nothing happens to this number. This bra interacts with this ket. Okay, and it's non-zero only when x dash equals x. So the integral washes away and I'm left with x minus b psi, which is simply psi x minus b. Now we're going to look at this result graphically. What does it mean? But I give you a couple of minutes to let it sink inside. It's very important you don't miss out on this. Suppose I am given a quantum state of psi, get psi. This is the state of the system. Corresponding to this psi, there is going to be a wave function. The wave function is psi overlap with x. This is the wave function in the position basis. Okay? This is denoted by psi without the get sign as a function of x. Now suppose I plot this wave function. Now it's a function so I can plot it. I can only plot if it's real. If it's a complex number, I have to plot the real part and the imaginary part separate because I can't plot complex numbers. Suppose it's real, so it's something easy to plot. Suppose the wave function looks like this. This is x axis, this is 0 and it peaks at some value x naught. This is the wave function. We know that this wave function has certain properties, it must be normalized and so on. Okay. Now what happens is, this is my quantum state, I haven't measured it. Okay. If I measure it, I know I will get a Dirac delta function at some measurement outcome, but I haven't measured it. However, I apply the translational operator on this quantum state. Now when I apply a translational operator through D onto this quantum state, I get a new state, say phi. Now this phi will have a certain wave function. And we prove <coughs> that this wave function is going to have the same form as the original because it's the psi. The original wave function is psi. The new wave function is also psi. It does not change the wave function. It only changes the argument which means it's going to shift this wave function to the left or to the right by a certain amount and that is d. Okay? So if I plot this shifted wave function, what should the new plot look like? What is the new wave function? It's going to be shifted towards your right. So the new wave function is the same form, the same shape, because it's the same wave function primarily, the same shape but it shifted to the right. And this P, for example, would now occur at x0 plus P. If I translate by minus, by this minus sign, if this B is positive, then this means that I've shifted my function, the wave function to the right, increasing values of x. For example, now if I take x, equal to x0 plus b. Right? In this shifted, in this blue function, this is phi. Phi of x. If phi at x0 plus b is equal to psi at x0 plus b minus b, which is psi at x0. So this value is the same as this value. Therefore, I am shifting the function to the right. 
This is what the translational operator is doing. It's translating the quantum state. Effectively, it's shifting the wave function to the left or to the right, depending upon whether D is positive or negative. That's why it's called a translational operator. We go phi at x naught plus d. This is the wave function as a function of x. But this equals this, right? Psi at x minus d. But what's the value of x? It's x naught plus d. So I subtract d from it, I get the wave function at x naught, original one. So this blue function, this peak occurs at x naught plus d for blue, and the peak occurs at x naught for the white. How? 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 How is it this minus d? This minus d is coming from here. This psi is this psi. Is given by the identity operator 
minus i dx some generator of translation which is now the momentum operator over h power ok so the momentum operator generates translations classically as well if you have a system possesses momentum it translates the system because it system then possesses velocity and velocity changes the position of the system so the system is translated in position so you can also write p b capital b as exponent minus iota b p over h bar right just as you can write the unitary operator as e minus iota h p over h bar we can write rotation as exponent minus i theta s over h bar and so on so this is the translational operator and this is the infinitesimal translational operator okay if we go towards the translation operator is go to expand then as a maclaurin series these are the first two terms zero order and the first order term you have additional terms as well which can be ignored in dx is point agree so it's the momentum that generates translations now comes a really important subject we break at 6 we'll take a 15 minutes break and then we have a quiz position momentum All right. Now suppose I have operator x, and I want to find it commutated with the translational operator to b x. I want to find this commutator. Both of them are operators. This we know is Hermitian. This is not Hermitian. Remember, the translational operator can be unitary, but it's not Hermitian. Now this operator acts on some state x, which is an eigenstate of this operator. It's not an eigenstate of this operator, but it's an eigenstate of this operator. Okay. So now let's. This commutator actually means x p d x. Minus p d x x operator acting on that x. Now could you please do the next step for me on your notebooks? What what is this equal to? Expand this out, right? Just expand it out. Tell me what the output is going to be. Now, x operator acting on this operator acting on this gives me x plus d x minus e d x. Now, this operator acting on this operator is this an eigenstate of this operator? Yes. yes. I get get x, and what's the eigenvalue? Yes. X. So I can put the x anywhere. Now, is this an eigenstate of this operator? Yes. It is. Every eigen, every position state is an eigenstate of the position operator. Okay? क्या मैं कुछ भी हो तो ये label है ना? So I get the eigen value is the label x plus b x x plus b x minus x x plus b x. Okay, now this becomes b x x plus b x. Okay, now this say get x plus b x. If you would like to write the right hand side, you can expand this state. 
in terms of uh, this state x plus dx if you write this as a Taylor series it becomes x can x plus the derivative of this state with respect to x x plus dx x get x into dx and higher order terms now the point is that if you would like to keep only the term to the lowest order to the first order in dx then this expression is approximately equal to dx get x okay so up to first order this get x plus dx is equal to get x there will of course be higher order terms as well but they will introduce an additional dx and that dx will multiply with the one here to give you dx squared okay these are higher order terms so if dx is small you can keep the lowest order term now if you keep only the lowest order term then looking at where you started off from and looking at your final state x t dx the commutator turns out to be equal to dx and if dx approaches 0 it's infinitesimally so small than this the approximation becomes an equality now you put the, the infinitesimal form of t dx you put it inside the commutator and let's see what we get what we get is x commutated with identity minus iota p x over h bar dx this commutator must equal dx. Okay? Now what's the commutator of x with identity? Zero. It commutes. Identity commutes with everything. So the commutator of x with this is non-zero. So what you have is minus iota h bar dx commutator of x with px equals dx this dx just goes away and I am left with a very famous result x commutated with px or p right I haven't used px I have just commutated with p gives me iota h bar No matter what your quantum state is, the position operator does not commute with the momentum operator. The commutator is always equal to iota h bar. This is the famous Heisenberg's uncertainty relationship from 1927. It's so famous and so important, I would like to write this out. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and we've already learned that if we have two operators A and B whose commutator is not equal to zero then there is an indeterminacy principle which means that if I set out to measure A the spread in the values of A or the uncertainty in A which is I measure repeated number of times what's the spread in the value of the measurement outcomes multiplied by the spread in the values of B in the observable B must be greater than or equal to half times the expectation value the modulus of the expectation value of the commutator Right? This is the indeterminacy principle. Okay? Which means that of course now the position and the momentum are they don't commute. They are not compatible observables. And I will give you the physical meaning of this. They are not compatible observables which means that if this were position 
and this for momentum, then the uncertainty in the values of x multiplied by the uncertainty in the values of momentum. And you know what the uncertainty means? I'll elaborate on this. Must be greater than or equal to half. Now this is just a number. So its expectation value is just the number itself. <coughs> its modulus is h bar. So this is the famous form of the uncertainty principle that we've encountered in the modern physics class, which is given in basic texts of modern physics. It's just the indeterminacy principle applied to two measurables that don't commute, two mutually incompatible observables. And I'll tell you what this physically means. But I'll give you half a minute to just assimilate this stuff. See what it means. Which means that 
the operator P acts on this P naught. This P naught is an eigenstate of the momentum operator. I get the state P naught back with an eigenvalue P naught. The momentum that I measure, the momentum outcome is P naught. And the probability that I'm getting this state is given by P naught overlap with or X naught overlap with P naught modulus squared. Now if I want to find out this overlap, I have to express this position eigenstate or this momentum eigenstate in the position basis. That we will learn in the next class. But I prepared a new momentum eigenstate. Now suppose I don't measure x. I directly input the state into a device that is measuring momentum. Input the same quantum state into a device that is measuring momentum without in an intervening position measurement. I don't measure the position. Now the new state that I will prepare is going to be some P naught dash, which is not the same as this state. I will prepare some other state. Okay. I can even prepare P naught, the same state here, but its probability is not going to be the same as the probability here. Altogether, this is a totally different experiment than this experiment, which means that position and momentum are incompatible observables. If I measure position, I disturb the momentum. I prepare a new momentum state. This state can be written in the momentum basis. This state in the momentum basis is totally different from this state in the momentum basis. I am preparing new states. So position and momentum are incompatible observables. In other words, if I have a double state experiment, I have a screen here. I'm firing electrons or protons or neutrons or photons into this state. I have two states here, S1 and S2. Generally, I will observe an interference pattern. Okay? Now, this interference pattern exists because the, the wave function of the electron passing through this state and the wave function of the electron passing through this state have a definite momentum. And this precise momentum relationship gives rise to interference fringes. We learn later how this fringe arises because it arises because of wavelength differences, of wavelength and path differences. So there has to be a precise wavelength to give you an interference fringe. Wavelength, P and the wavelength are related to pi over lambda, right? Unit vector K. So if I have a precise wavelength, or a precise momentum, I will be able to get these fringes. Now what I do, I place a detector here or some non-destructive detector so that the photon passes through it but it's not, it doesn't collapse the photon. Now this detector will click when a photon passes through this link. Now I have gained information about the position of the, of the photon whether the photon is taking this slate or it's passing through this slate. When I gain information about the position, I'm becoming precise about the position, which means I prepare an eigenstate x0. This x0 has a certain position. Its uncertainty in its position is zero. And if I would like to satisfy the uncertainty principle, the uncertainty in momentum has to go to infinity. So if I gain information about the path, the interference fringe just disappears and I get a, a random block. I don't get fringes because now I know where the position of the photon is, where the position of the electron is. So the uncertainty in momentum spreads out to infinity. I do not get any interference fringes. If I don't know the position, which means I don't know the part of the photon, I get nice interference patterns because there is no uncertainty in the momentum and there is total uncertainty in the position. I don't know the position, which means I am totally ignorant of the position. So if I obtain which path information, which slit the electron passes through, 
I increase the spread in the values of the momentum so no interference takes place, no fringes are there. And recall my lectures from the modern physics class. Okay? So this is also a manifestation of the uncertainty principle. Now what we'll do is we we'll meet uh, at uh, probably 25 minutes past 6. Okay? You can pray Maghrib in between. Six thirty should go there.